welcome back producer Kelly Ryan and a man who needs no introduction, H. Allen Scott. I always love an introduction though. This is H. Allen Scott. Hi everyone, it's cold. It's very cold here. Thank you for coming all the way from warm LA to oh. a freezing day in Boston. God, I, would, I love Boston so much, but it's so cold. <laughs> At least it's warm in here. So it is warm. It is warm <laughs> in here. We're you for a while. Being snuggly. Um, I want to start by asking, I think one of the things that uh, rewatching the film really struck me is the structure of the film. And this is a question for both of you. Because you start with so many clips from these cultural moments and you talk about how your initial connection to Judaism came from seeing Jews on TV and in culture. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how you structured the film, and this is to both of you and also um, particularly to Kelly. And then to you, I'm curious about how your relationship to these cultural views and cultural iconography from Judaism have shifted as you've gone through the uh, process of becoming Jewish. I think you're going to start. I'd Should like, I start? Yeah, I want you to talk a little bit about the references, because that's so much Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm, as a comic, I love a reference. There's, there's nothing better than referencing something, uh, especially a pop cultural thing. And for me as a kid, you know, there were people that I was obsessed with, like Bette Midler and, and, and Nora Ephron especially. And uh, I didn't know they were Jewish because the only Jew I knew was like Steven Spielberg. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't know anything about Judaism growing up in Kirkwood, Missouri, which is a city outside St. Louis. And so I just thought they were funny. And then as I grew up and started performing. When I first performed when I was 17, I basically did a B. Arthur comedy set. I, everything was like Dorothy from the Golden Girls. I mean, every delivery, every line, I would do pregnant pauses, no one would laugh. And, but she, B. Arthur, proud Jew, you know what I mean? And I was, I was sort of using the vernacular of sort of cultural Jews and comedy without knowing it. And then of course, I figured out that they were all Jews, and that has to have meant something, and I don't know exactly what, even to this day, but it did. And now, you know, I, I am so fortunate to be in a community of other Jews who are creative professionally, and like Elliot in the film, Elliot Glazer, and his sister Alana from Broad City, and it's just, it's, I feel so fortunate that, that the people that I idolized as a kid, I've now kind of become one of those people that I, I don't, you know what I mean? Like the Jewish performers who are proudly Jewish in their comedy and who are trying to create content that isn't necessarily just Jewish, but is Jewish, is very Jewish. And um, I'm really proud of that, yeah. And I think to add to that from a producing point of view, Elisa Rosen, the director, amazing. Um, sorry, she can't be here tonight. She's at Napa Valley for the film festival over there. Warm. And it's much warmer there. They're doing croquet there and all those wonderful things. Um, you know, when trying to tell a story, it's important to really find out where you came from. And there was something in H. Allen's journey that he didn't just wake up one day deciding this was his next journey. There was some part of him from a very early age that identified with thematics within the Jewish community. And he didn't know it yet, but when he started piecing it together, as H. Allen said, it was this realization that all the cultural references, you know, perhaps friendships, there were different things that spoke to him. And I think nothing is really by accident. I think things are kind of in your path that ultimately bring you to where you're meant to be. And in that case, in, in doing this film, it was very important that you understand, and for us to tell as filmmakers, it's not a linear event. It's, we all kind of go through these roads of discovery, and it ultimately leads to, who are you, and how do you see yourself? So those types of references, I think, add a richness to H. Allen and understanding not just this process and what he is now, but where he came. And it's not necessarily just, I had cancer, and I was a Mormon, and it was all the things, as for all of us, really. Uh, just to piggyback on that, I really think in her saying that, it, it shows the importance of art in all forms, written, movies, theater, comedy, etc., and the power of art in influencing people, both 
societally, politically, socially, sexually. I mean, I think there are so many levels that art plays into who we are as a people that we don't even, I, I don't think, recognize. And I think you could say, like, very callously that, oh, I love Bette Midler, so I converted to Judaism to be closer to Bette, which I would be okay with. <laughs> but that's not just it. But it is a vessel to get there, and that's a really beautiful thing. Well, I love that, because you structured the film really in this way that was like, this was your Andre point, and then you sort of took it from there, and by the end, it's not there, because, because you are that. Um, I think talking about sort of this core kernel of Judaism in you or, or who you are, um, I think we have to talk about your amazing mother, who I, I thought it was really interesting when you said, you know, I, I mean, it was a joke, but you said, I thought my mom would be totally excited for me exploring this new thing. And I thought, well, that's really interesting because you're leaving behind something that you shared with her um, in, in your original faith. And, and I, think, um, I think that that showed something very fundamental in her understanding of who you are. Can you talk a little bit about your mom? Yeah, I love my mother. How much do we love his mother, my by the way? My mother's amazing. I she see really this is. film like a jillion times, and I'm still in the back crying every time I yeah. see her face. I don't know what it is. It's a Hallmark her. movie. I she know. really is. Um, <laughs> no, she is incredible. She, uh, you know, I look at my mom, and I, I, I can't help, I, I, you know, I'm a queer person living in the United States right now, and I see... I look at my relationship with my mother in that light because I think queer kids have a special relationship with their parents because it, we didn't f turn out like the rest. You know what I mean? Like society says the rest are supposed to turn out. And there's that bond that you have, especially in my case with my mom, that she understood me. You know, like when we were kids, she would always say to me and my brothers, when you guys grow up and have kids, and then she would turn to me and go, or adopt. And there was always, an understanding or a caveat from me and it forms this relationship and as I got to be an adult the relationship turned from mother-son to being a friend and I think in a lot of ways my mom missed out on things that she wanted to do because she sacrificed a lot to have a family and to exist in the world that a woman had to exist in the 1980s in order to have a family and do the things she wanted to do and um, and I find now she is able to, we're able to have a relationship that's very adult and we can communicate on a level where I know what she wants and she wants so much more than just taking care of, you know, my brother who has a disability and the health problems that are all involved in her life and she wants to go places and see things and exist and I really see this even as a story of what happens, I think, to people who are marginalized and who are forced into a mold that you're told you're supposed to be one thing and live one way and react in one way, and the ability to break out of that mold and to do something else, I think she taught me to break out of that mold at a very young age and to be myself, and I think now in some way, by converting, I'm showing her that she can break out of that mold, and it's a, it's a reversal in a way. And so our relationship is um, just as deep. Justice Dean. I think one of the things that's exceptional about this film is it's not, it is your story and it's a very personal story, but it is also the st story of so many other people and that, you t uh, that you meet through the film. Um, and I'm curious about how you chose to who to include or um, how you met, I mean, you know, from your trip to Israel, but also in New York and the, and the other um, couple that converted from Mormonism. Um, there's so many fascinating characters who reach different connections to Judaism. Um, what was the choice to include other people and, and who to include them? I'll let you talk on the choices, but I'll, I will say when I, when we first, when Eliza first sort of pitched me the idea for the movie, because I, it's the first thing in my professional career where I didn't beg someone to give me money for, and someone came to me and were like, I want to make a movie about you. Um, and I told her one of my ground rules was we can't, bash Mormons. You know, we can't, I just, I'm not a hateful person. I don't, I believe in like starting with love and getting deeper from there. And I, I just, I don't believe in that. And so I wanted to include other stories of Mormonism and the complex realities of Mormonism. And in doing that, you know, after the film, like we were talking about before, we went and had some wine. Um, and we were talking about how, you know, queer Mormons and 
and queer Orthodox and people from Hasidic communities who have left or been isolated because of their trans identity or whatever have, have come to me and said, explain their own story and trying to find an identity that's still spiritual, you know, because that's so fundamental to who we are, but also allows them to be authentically themselves. And uh, I'm really proud that the film has done that. So it was important to me to include other stories and I'll let you talk about how we got there. And I think that was something I'm so happy that you found that because, you know, we really felt that each of these uh, characters, if you will, or people that are so involved in H. Allen's journey from back then to currently, um, you know, they added such depth to who H. Allen was because they really provided the mirror of what H. Allen was facing at that moment in his life. So whether it was through, you know, going through chemo and going through that recovery or the decision with Rabbi Zach to go on that journey, each person provided a template for where H. Allen was in his life and they were all equally as important. It's kind of like a threaded quilt. You can't just tell the story, well, this is his family and this is his rabbi. Each story matters. And I think that was one of the themes that was really important to us in making this film, period, is that we didn't want it to be a gay story, we didn't want it to be a cancer story, a we wanted it to be a human story, a human interest story that no matter who you are, where you come from, whatever it is, that you found a sense of connection, you were able to live through that experience by living through H. Allen's character, who he is as a person, or the other people as well. So that's that's the joy for us, and that when we think about kind of structuring this story and how to tell it in a relatable, meaningful, empathetic way, you have to include the wounds, you have to include the high, you have to include you know, everything, and, and that was important. And I, I'll just to speak to the Mormon couple. Um, so the Mormon couple, straight couple, clearly, uh, they, they were a part of the progressive Mormon movement. For a few years there, there was a progressive Mormon movement where people would um, hope or start lobbying the Mormon hierarchy in trying to be more inclusive, including uh, both LGBTQ people, but also women into areas of leadership within the Mormon faith and other things. And then when the Supreme Court ruled on marriage equality in 2013, the Mormon church hierarchy thought it was important to do a hard stance on sort of their stance on homosexuals and homosexual families. And they made a rule saying that same-sex couples who have children, the children of same-sex couples, have to wait until they're 18 to a to baptize, uh, and then at that time they have to choose between the family and the church. And there was a line in the sand for a lot of Mormon couples, especially progressive Mormons in general, and my mother included, um, because it just well, it felt spiteful and hateful in a lot of ways. And so the Mormon couple in the film, that was their line. And I, I was so moved by them because, you know, we need allies. Queer people need allies, especially right now with not to get political, but with Trump and everything that's happening, we need allies and we need straight people, specifically straight people, to stand up and say, this is wrong, this is my friend, this is my neighbor, this is my doctor, et cetera, et cetera. And they did that and they left the Mormon church and, and they needed that spiritual community and they found Roma Moo in New York and, uh, and, and now they, I think they're moving to Jerusalem. They went all the way. They went all the way. <laughs> I'm not doing that. No, ma'am. I'd love to open it to audience questions. Did I stand in the back? Yeah. I have a question. Did a friend of yours, the mother who didn't meet you, has she seen this film and reached out to you at all? So has the mother of your friend who did not want to meet you seen the film, and has she reached out to you since the film was made? I don't know if she's seen the film. I know the film might be in the Atlanta Jewish Film yes. Festival. I don't know. So maybe. Um, but. I, uh, I sort of have, uh, it's still hard for me, that whole moment and the whole story of my friend Derek because, you know, not to be like super gay all the time and every answer is gay, but um, queer people have this idea of sort of a chosen family and the family you come from and, you know, in a way that life that we moved, when we moved to New York City, we moved to create a new life and to sort of have a family of people that we could identify with that were like-minded. And I think Derek and our group of friends really felt that. And we sort of escaped this, the doggedness 
of the family that we came from in some ways to try to just be ourselves and find ourselves. And I had talked with Derek a lot about that. And so it was important for me to have some closure with her after Derek's passing five years later. And the coincidence, it really was a coincidence. We didn't plan this, but um, my chemo or my cancer, I had a five year remission mark and it all lined up with my remission Derek's passing, the five-year anniversary of Derek's passing, and the bar mitzvah. They all were around the same week, which is insane to me. Um, and so when we went, and that happened, what you saw in the film, it was, it was crushing for me because, and I, I couldn't help but read into it, I knew there was something deeper to it, and it felt like a judgment to me. And I don't know her story, and I, I don't know what it's like to lose a child, and it's horrible, and I don't even want to, I would never want to cause her more pain in that regard. Um, and I think if I did reach out to her, I would cause her more pain, and I don't want to do that. And conversely, I also want to respect my own identity and my own truth and who I am and the relationship I had with Derek. So, no, I don't think she has. All the way in the back. First of all, uh, what a spectacular film. What a wonderful family you have, and what an entertaining personality you are specifically. <laughs> Thank you. It's not a surprise. <laughs> Have you experienced anything like that? I know your mom wasn't over the moon initially with you converting. I think that your answer, she, you were taking away, or, or she felt like she was losing a shared connection with you. But in your, your larger circle of people that you were raised with, So the question is, is there, do you, have you noticed a connection between, or an affinity within Mormonism for Jews? Or, um, and I guess, I guess we can expand the question even to say, you know, it's, it's very interesting that both you and, and the couple in New York have found Judaism. Is there something there that you're taught in, in, in Mormonism that maybe um, inspires a connection to Judaism or? or? Yeah, um, I, well, a few responses. Um, Salt Lake City Mormons are very different than Mormons outside of Salt Lake in a lot of respects because Salt Lake City Mormons, and I've been to Salt Lake a bunch both when I was Mormon and then touring and comedy and being there um, just after being Mormon and now being Jewish. Uh, and Salt Lake City Mormons are kind of like, you know, New York Catholics. They're just, they, they're, they're still, you know, having sex before marriage and doing all the bad things, and <laughs> they're doing the bad stuff. Uh, that said, they're still Mormon or they're still Catholic, whatever, you know. Uh, and there's a reason why Mormons have a fascination with Jews. And if uh, you're, Mo I'm a, I love history, student of history. That's why I love being in Boston. And one of the things that Joseph Smith did was he was a great stealer. Um, so I noticed that when I was converting, a lot of the practices within Judaism are very similar to the practices within Mormonism. There's a lot of similarities there. And like, for example, the baptism and also the mikvah, and they're, that's very alike. Um, and also the sort of the way we organize Sunday services are very similar to the reform movement's Friday night services or Saturday morning services. So there's a lot of similarities there, and I, I, I'm not surprised when Mormons sort of like Jews. That said, I'm not very popular with Mormons. Um, I, I, I don't know why, no. I love Mormons, I think Mormons are great and I, I respect anyone's faith and their outlook on life. Um, but I also know that one of the things that I love about being Jewish is that I have choice. I can dissent, you know what I mean? I, nothing that I say, for the most part, is gonna get me excommunicated from being a Jew. I can say, not so sure about God this week, or, eh, I don't know if I like that whole thing that's happening in Israel. And I'm not going to get excommunicated for it. Whereas if I was a Mormon saying, I don't believe in God, or I don't believe in the celestial kingdom, or that there's three tiers of it, or that I need to be sealed in some temple, if I said that, that would get me excommunicated. Or there would be a target on me to have more of a spiritual sort of focus. So 
there's less freedom in that religion, and I need a lot of breathing room. So, um, so yeah. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank yeah. you. Right here in the red shirt. So, so what inspired you to become a comic, and how did that play into your um, your Judaism? Yeah, I um, I struggle on one-on-one -on -one conversations. Always have. I'm very. I don't like social settings, and I never really leave the house unless I have a microphone involved. And so, <laughs> I, it's 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 really uncomfortable for me to do that. I mean, Kelly knows this. There's a true story. there are so many rules when it comes to even Q and As that I'm just like I. It can't be there beforehand. Like I just, it's it, it's hard for me. It's mentally, it's, there's a lot of anxiety. And um, I think when I started in comedy, it was a way for me to communicate the things that were happening in my head that I needed to communicate. And uh, and I think comedy made me a better Jew in some ways because you know. Judaism for me is about the story and telling a story and, and where I fall within the scope of the Jewish story. And fundamentally, comedy is a story about being a storyteller and sharing your slice of life and your perspective and hoping that somebody else takes something from it. And uh, I think in some way, being a comedian prepared me to how to communicate being a, a Jew, being a proud Jew. and and how faithfully I'm committed to the Jewish community. So the, let, let me, let me um, because I think it's harder to hear in the back, the, the story is about someone, um, this woman walked into, she was going to an event at a church, and a woman in the church came up to her, she said, I'm in the wrong place, I'm Jewish, and, and somebody came up to her and said, I need to talk to you privately, I actually have felt that I'm, that I'm Jewish, I've, I've never felt quite comfortable, and that she might have some Jewish past. And you talk about having a Jewish spirit. And the question was at what age? And also, what did it mean to you? I think that it, it seems that what, what it meant, means to you to have a Jewish spirit has really evolved over this process. And um, so at what age did you sort of recognize it as a Jewish spirit, which you talk about a little bit in the film? And then also, I guess, I'm curious how that's changed since the making of the film. Yeah. Um. When you, asked, when you said your story, I just thought of how funny it is. How many Jews across the world do you think accidentally said, I don't belong here, I'm Jewish. Like, how many funny things do you think have come from that in history? Um, <laughs> um, but I love that story because I, I hear it often. And I think, you know, I think for me, the moment really was, I remember they kept delaying my baptism because I was such a bad Mormon. And, and I remember distinctly sitting, at, one thing that's not in the film is the thing that really made me convert, sure was my mom's pressuring, but was also um, that the elder who, the missionary and the elder, but the missionary specifically that was assigned to me during my baptism was incredibly attractive. And I 
was, I was late in getting baptized, so I was going through puberty, so, you know, all of that was happening, and Brad Pitt was really popular, and he had blonde hair, and the missionary had blonde hair, and it was a whole sort of, like, maybe this could work for me. And I remember being in the process of going through the baptism, and the, the whole thing of him saying, me asking, like, why are we so focused on ha what happens after we die, when we should be focused on the here and now, and him saying, you just have to have faith. And in my head, I'm only thinking, I just have faith in you. <laughs> you know, like, that's like, that was the only thing. And I remember, and I, I, this seems like a joke, but it really, I do mean it. When I got baptized, I, Mormons put you, you're supposed to be like in a body of water, but Mormons are economical, so it's really just a bathtub in the church. And, and you're in front of everyone who knows you, and you're in a white sort of outfit, and there's nothing on underneath. You can't wear anything. And it's usually children, you know. But I was in puberty, so there was, things were growing around me, on me, and, and in a white clingy outfit, and wet, and see-through, and embarrassing. Um, but I wasn't thinking of any of that when I was getting baptized, because in the, when you get baptized, you have the missionary who holds you, who dunks you, and then you have an elder from the church who stands above you and says all the prayers. And the elder wasn't that attractive, but my missionary was. And he held me and he dropped me into the water, right, during it. And this is supposed to be the height of the spiritual Mormon, or the spiritual moment in, the Mormon, in your Mormon story, the start of your Mormon story, really, where you are beginning your life as a Mormon. And I'm not thinking about Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, Jesus, Mormonism. I'm only thinking that my head, this part of my head, is inches away from what makes this man a good missionary. You know what I mean? From his midsection, to be direct. I know we're in puritanical Boston. I'm not going to say what I want to say. Um, but that's all I was thinking. And so I jokingly say, that was the moment I knew I wasn't Mormon. And everything that led up to that moment of them saying I just had to have faith told me that something was off here. I know now it was that I had a Jewish soul and that I was supposed to be going in a different direction. But at the time, I just was kind of lost and figured it was all about this guy's junk. And, and, and I found my way through a lot of junk um, to Judaism. And, and yeah, so that was my moment. Weird moment, I know. <laughs> That's what you thought it would be, right? <laughs> How has your evolution as a Jew continued since your conversion? Yeah, one of the things that I love about this whole experience, it was really important for me during the film that I had to figure out and define my role within the Jewish story, like I said earlier. And over the course of the film, I, I really, really found a place of comfort in knowing, I mean, because a lot of converts, I mean, Kelly's also converting, and I think anyone who knows a convert knows that some, some of them can be very devout Jews and they, can, they become the most religious Jews, but others sometimes they have this sense of doubt in like they're not fully accepted or they're not fully 100% Jewish or because they don't have the Jewish mother line, they, they're just not Jewish and it's this disconnect that you have. And for me, it was in finding sort of my purpose within the Jewish story and, and my purpose I know is to communicate and to tell stories. I suck at everything else in life. I've been fired from so many jobs. All I know how to do is tell stories and talk. And fortunately, Jews like talkers. So I found a right community for career longevity. Um, but I, my role is as a communicator, as a story, and to tell my story. And since the filming, the end part of your question, um, what I have found is another part of my role is taking on sort of the, some of the marginalized people who have been forced out of other communities because of their identities and, and who have a feeling that they want to have a spiritual identity within the Jewish faith, but they don't know where they fit because of the things that make them marginalized. And because outside people are telling them, because of these things that make you different, you don't belong here. And I've, I'm so grateful that people feel comfortable enough to come to me, and I think that's the power of art and comedy, that people feel comfortable enough to come to me to say, I'm a trans woman, and I've been kicked out of my Hasidic community, and now she does drag in New York and she's living a fabulous life and she's able to connect with me on a spiritual level, but she doesn't feel comfortable to go to a reformed church because of her background or a reformed temple. So she comes to me and we DM on Instagram and talk about drag and then Shabbat and all these things. And that's the most beneficial thing for me is that Jews, 
of all kinds have kind of been able to find a different way of being Jewish through my story. Even Jews who, you know, were born and raised Jews, but they kind of stopped being Jewish when, at their bar and bat mitzvahs. Now they see in my story that they don't necessarily have to go to temple to be Jewish all the time. You know, you can be Jewish in lots of different ways. And I really love that people are finding different ways to be Jewish. And I think that's going to, you know, create a future for the Jewish community that, that um, hopefully is a bit stronger. I don't know. I mean, I'm going to ask you this, Kelly, and if you're not um, comfortable answering it, don't. But I'm curious sort of how, um, how working while you're, you worked on this film while you're in the process of converting, just like H. Allen was, and, and I'm curious sort of how that influenced your own journey. I think for me, uh, the biggest thing, I know I asked you this, we sat and talked about it before I started my classes. This was something I wanted to do since I was 18, very much like your story with your this woman you ran into. I grew up Catholic and I went to go um, live on a kibbutz when I was 18. I never left Chicago, I never left the country. My Jewish hairdresser was going and I need to get away, and I did it. I, I don't even know how I ended up there, but I remember I was like, I'm home. Like it was, it was crazy. And so for me, I had this piece in my head that all my friends were Jewish. I took my daughter to the J, you know, even though she was going to Sunday school. I just, I always was doing the things just intuitively. Um, and so when I went through this process of making this film, it was very apparent to me that I just, and especially with the state of things and, and you know, there was some violence that had happened. This, and like that was a moment I called my best friend, Tracy Schwartz, and I said, now I'm doing it. I am proud to do this and I'm taking ownership of what I've always felt to be true. My biggest concern was would I be accepted? And so that was my number one question to H. Allen. We talked quite a bit about it. I was worried that I'd be a fraud, a fake, would I be accepted? I mean, you would think a woman in her 40s, she would know better to ask such questions, but these were valid questions that for somebody who is converting, you know, can you really be included? And, you know, that was something in going through the filming and seeing just each step of the way for, he didn't go through the conversion process in the film, but just recognizing what it means to be Jewish, I just really embraced that. And I fell in love with, every, you know, whether it's Rabbi Zach or all the different people, I fell in love with how inclusive everybody was in just, you know, an idea that a person took ownership of who they felt they were and come. And so that to me was like very rewarding in working on this film to give me the confidence to finally do the thing I always wanted to do since, you know, I was 18. Time for a few more questions. Right there. How did Elisa find you? How did Elisa find you? Yeah, it's a funny story, of Good course. Question. Um, I was uh, selling a true crime reality comedy series. <laughs> uh, so funny. It, it, it didn't go anywhere. That didn't really take off, unfortunately. But in the meeting, she worked for a production company that I was trying, begging, to sell it to. And she, um, she heard my story, and she saw... She saw your star. Yeah, she saw a star of David, and she was like... She's very, I mean... She's a good Jew. She's, um, she's, she's very aggressive and pushy. And she immediately was like, what's the star of David necklace for? Are you Jewish? And I, I said, yeah, I'm Jewish. She was like, H. Allen Scott, that's not a Jewish name. You're not Jewish. And I was like, yes, I am. I'm Jewish. And we were at this like fancy Hollywood place, and I only went because she was paying. And, and it was this weird back and forth. And then she pitched this idea to me. I told her my story, and she pitched this idea to me. And within a couple of weeks, we were filming, and it just sort of, and then two months later, we're in Israel, and it just sort of all happened, yeah. Yeah, she is. She's a, she is an amazing woman. Pushy, but amazing. She's, no, she's amazing. And, and what the, to, to, Elise, to Elisa's credit, what I love is that she it just took that one identifier for in H. Allen, and she saw the story. She saw everything. And to me, that that's not something I think I actually would have ever seen in meeting you at first. And so, you know, it's been really fun to work with her and with Todd Schatz, our other producer. On she this. did ask me if I had uh, if I had signed the story with anyone else. She's she so did. Hollywood. She's awesome. she so Hollywood. was like, "Did you sell the story yet?" 
Am I infringing on anyone's rights? <laughs> and this wasn't the original title, is that it? No, oh no. my god, she loves saying this and I hated it from the first. <laughs> she called it, what does she call it? The My big fat gay bar mitzvah or something? Something along those lines. And I immediately was like, we're not calling it that. <laughs> I would like to live in another section of Netflix, thank you. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's, she's funny. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know her? Yeah, she's, you know her? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's amazing. Her family is amazing. In fact, the rabbi from Romamu in the film is her brother-in-law. She contacted, when we were trying to find the Mormon couple, she contacted, she says this because she's like, you know, my brother-in-law knows rich Jews and I needed money, so I called him. And he's like, no, I'm not gonna give you money. I'm not gonna, I need money too. And so they said no, and then she told the story to him and then he was like, oh, we just happened to have this couple, this Mormon couple who's converting. And it just sort of, and it was happening at the same time we were filming and it really just all came together. But you're right, it, it, she that, pays off being pushy. That was the luckiest thing in the movie. So you met, you met that couple through the film? Yeah, through oh, the film, yeah, yeah. Right here. How did you get connected? So the other producer, Todd Schatz, who is not here, he met Elisa at another screening we were at just producing stuff. And I worked with Todd. He's one of my producing partners. I worked with him on another film. He also um, works with Hebrew Helpers, which helps people prepare for their bar and bat mitzvahs and um, is helping me with my Hebrew too. <laughs> but no, we all kind of connected. But the crazy thing is none of us knew each other. And yes, within like, you know, weeks, we were all working together very closely and going to Israel. So it was very serendipitous. But like also, like any Jew, we were all connected in like weird ways. You know what I mean? Like I got to Eliza because I knew FBI crime profiler Jim Clemente. <laughs> he solved the Jean Benet case, which I solved years ago. Follow the too. fruit. That's a different subject. But, um, and, and so I knew that. And then she knew Jim, of course. And then... She knew Todd from something else, but then I knew Todd because Todd wanted to go on a date with me. Oh my God, years that's ago. right. I from years, that. like years ago when I was much thinner. And then, and then, and then Todd knew you, so it was, this, it was a weird, yeah, it was weird. Todd is my wannabe husband. If I could marry, he has a husband already, but if I could marry him, I would marry him. He's the perfect one. I wish he was here so you could meet him. There's another question right here. What? Because you should be a big star. Ah. So the comment is that the film was great and you should be a big star. And what is next for you? What apart from being a big star. Oh, stop. <laughs> Tell Instagram that. Oh, say that again? I do. I do. I'm going to do all the things. I'm going to do her documentary next, yeah. you know, <laughs> Father, Son, Holy Jew. Um, uh, <laughs> that's a good one, right? Thank you. Been doing this for a few years. Uh, no, what's next for me? I, I do, I mean, you know, we were talking about this earlier, the creative, like, I'm working on a lot of different things, and I, I never really think of, like, the next thing, but one thing I, I also do drag, and I, um, I have this, like, new Snapchat series that's coming out with my drag persona, and so there's lots of different things, and I'm working on this other show, and there's writing, and there's all... I'm always evolving and changing, and, but I will always be a Jew. Yeah. <laughs> and Kelly, what are you working on now? Same, I'm, I'm producing a couple more things. One more thing with Todd Schatz. I'm shooting something in December, I'm writing. Um, you know, I've written cookbooks, I raise kids, I write She's magazines. five kids. Yeah, so. Wow. I, just, I, knew, I knew that would get a response. It always did that. Yeah. yeah, no. It's so it's always something, and we were talking about this earlier, that, you know, just, it's kind of like I was just watching the Joan Didion um, documentary on the way here, and I've seen it a million times. I'm in love with her. But the idea is, you know, we all are creatives, and we all do different things in our lives to kind of mirror where we're at in our life. So I think for both of us, it's always fun to think about, yeah, you do whatever, whatever you want next. Yeah. And what's next for Latter-day Jew? Where is this going? Oh, um, well, we, I'll be in uh, New Jersey tomorrow and um, Philadelphia after that. And, and we, um, we're doing the festival circuit right now, so tell your friends to check it out, ladderedg.com. And then we will be hopefully on a streamer near you once we start selling the film 
after we start winning all the awards at the festivals. So vote for the film when you leave and tell your friends to come tomorrow at 1 p.m. at Coolidge Corner Theater. Thank you all for being Thank here. You. Thank you both for being here.